From the FJC in Washington, D.C., I'm Mark Sherman, and this is Off Paper. United States Probation and Pretrial Services officers have a unique mission. They're both law enforcement officers and providers of social services. They both investigate and supervise individuals awaiting trial, before sentencing, and after release, and report to the court all along the way. Today on Off Paper, we explore what every line officer needs to know about the training and education available to them, the what, how, and why, and where to get it. The education and training of law enforcement officers can be a black box, often to the officers themselves. Over the course of their careers, federal probation and pretrial officers will receive training from multiple agencies and actors to include the district in which officers are hired, the Federal Probation and Pretrial Academy, located at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, or FLETC, the Federal Judicial Center, and the United States Sentencing Commission. Here's training specialist Julie Capsambellis of the U.S. Probation Office for the Middle District of Florida describing officer onboarding in her district. We give them an opportunity to meet everybody. So we bring them to what I call the mothership, our uh, headquarters here in Tampa. And if that's not possible, then key people will go to them, to wherever they are. And we just give them an overview of the various areas of our function. We always assign a mentor, but then another kind of a contact, somebody who just knows folks in the district. And then some exposure to our culture training early on. And just having somebody occasionally checking in with them. How's it going, you know? Officers have to navigate among multiple agencies for training, and senior U.S. probation officer and training coordinator January Welks from the District of Connecticut has a great take on how the academy at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and district training fit together. Those new officers who have gotten back after the in-person experience, they're that much more well-versed when it comes to scenarios and officer safety. Having the repetition of five days a week for six weeks of doing scenarios and being in the mat room is really unparalleled. They just come back revitalized and excited about the work, I think really with more stability for an officer to try and understand, this is what I learned about the national level. How do I apply that here to districts? Finally, Officer training provided by multiple agencies runs the risk of incoherence if there isn't a clear vision from the top of the department, meaning from the chief probation or pretrial services officer, about the importance of career-focused officer education. Joining me to help us understand the ins and outs of officer education are my colleagues Stephanie Denton, Chief of the Training and Safety Division of the Probation and Pretrial Services Office at the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, and Raquel Wilson, Director of the Education and Sentencing Practice Unit at the United States Sentencing Commission. Stephanie and Raquel, welcome to Off Paper. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us. It's great to have you here. So the three of us are here to talk about our favorite subject, which is the thing the three of us and our teams are engaged in every day, and that is educating officers. And maybe the best place to begin is to simply describe the fundamentals of who provides officer education and training. It's sort of a unique arrangement in the federal system, and I think it's not apparent to officers and lots of other people about who's responsible for training officers and why. Now, because officers, soon after being hired, attend the Federal Probation and Pretrial Academy, we should probably start there. So, Stephanie, could you describe what the Academy is and a little bit about its history? The mission of the Federal Probation and Pretrial Academy is to provide probation and pretrial services officers with the training necessary to perform their duties effectively, efficiently, and as safely as possible while upholding the integrity, values, and dignity of the federal judiciary. So, with that being said, that's our mission. But since the National Training Academy, which is now the Federal Probation and Pretrial Academy, opened its doors in January 2005, it's changed a lot. We began teaching just firearms and safety in a few classes, uh, core classes at the academy, so a three-week class, and now it's transitioned to not only firearms and safety, but many, many classes for a six-week program. We work a lot of different methodologies into it, all the way from lecture to laboratory exercises to practical exercises to written exams and to ELM. Raquel, similar question. Perhaps describe the Sentencing Commission and then talk about 
the role of the sentencing, the education and sentencing practice unit in the context of the agency's mission? So the Sentencing Commission was created in 1984 with the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, and the first guidelines were issued in 1987. The training mission of the commission is contained in the statute. Congress was dissatisfied with various disparities in sentencing, and there had been all kinds of academic research. Mark, I know you're quite familiar uh, with some of that academic research about what federal sentencing was like before the Sentencing Reform Act. So our core mission is to promulgate guidelines. After the Booker case, of course, the guidelines were rendered advisory rather than presumptive, but the mission is, is the same as it ever was. That said, the Sentencing Reform Act also created other functions, one of which is research and data, but the other is training. And there's actually a specific provision that says that we are empowered to train probation officers, court staff, and all those connected with federal sentencing. So I became head of the unit in 2015 and really just continued the work that the unit had been doing, traveling and conducting trainings in person in various districts, holding a national seminar. So it's really been a pleasure to walk into this role. And so I'm, I'm wearing two hats in this episode, and it's unusual for me because I'm usually the host who gets to ask all the questions and, and have fun discussions, and we're certainly doing that here. But the other hat I'm wearing is as the Assistant Division Director for Probation and Pretrial Services Education here at the FJC. So folks, there's yet a third agency that deals with officer education, and that is our very own Federal Judicial Center. And we were created in 1967 by an act of Congress to provide education, training, and research for judicial officers and court staff. And court staff include, obviously, probation and pretrial services officers. There are three teams. Our team, probation and pretrial services education, provides education primarily to line officers. Then we have an executive education group that provides education to executives and court unit teams, executive teams, sort of at the top of the food chain across the judiciary, but that includes chief probation officers and deputy chief probation officers. And then we've got a management and professional development education group that provides education to folks at the managerial level, which includes supervisory probation and pretrial services officers. So we've got three separate agencies here at the table, but we all work very closely together because we're all within the judiciary, federal judiciary. And in fact, it's actually helpful to have three separate agencies that are independent from each other, but working within the same branch of government because we do really have different missions. The academy primarily, not exclusively, but primarily delivers the Introductory Probation and Pretrial Training Program. This is the core program offered by the Academy, including but not limited to safety and firearms training. And it's at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in North Charleston. And that's sort of the general mission for the Academy. For the FJC, it's it's like, what happens after the Academy, right? The FJC is sort of continuing professional education for what we refer to as experienced officers, which is a very low bar, meaning anybody who's graduated from the academy, from the initial probation and pretrial uh, training program, or IPIT, um, as you refer to it, Stephanie. In addition to the education and training that we do, one of the things that we do is that's kind of under the radar screen is the organizational development work where we will work with individual probation and pretrial services offices on things like strategic planning or mission, vision, and values statements or those kinds of things, really helping to develop the probation and pretrial services office as an organization. And then with sentencing, sentencing has become such an extraordinarily specialized area that it it makes total sense for there to be a separate training unit to help probation officers who specialize in sentencing, kind of picking up where officers left off at the academy. Stephanie, interested in your reactions to that, and then Raquel. 
Mark, I, th- I think uh, you said it clearly. So I think it is very important for continued collaboration so that we aren't necessarily working on the same things. And if we are working on the same things, maybe we're working toward a common goal on something that's missing for our new officers or our seasoned officers. I wholeheartedly agree with Stephanie, and I feel as though we can really work more closely to reinforce each other's work. Because as you said, Mark, you know, sentencing is such a specialty, and it's not just because of the sentencing guidelines, it's because of all the case law that comes with it, it's because of statutory changes. One of the things that I heard very early on in my tenure from basically every chief probation officer in the country is that they need more training for newer officers. We had plans in the works for a post-academy program. People who perhaps completed the academy, you know, two, three, maybe five years prior, and they've been writing PSRs, they understand the basics, they understand the fundamentals, but they need more, you know, they need more practice. Okay, well, I've written the PSR, but now I have an objection. Or I've settled all the objections, but now the judge is asking me questions that I'm not fully comfortable answering. We planned the first program of 24 students for April 2020. So you know what happened to that. (laughs) It's really great to hear you two talk about the roles of your agencies because I feel like going forward, um, we can do a much better job of help helping each other, you know, reinforce uh, our respective agencies work. And that will just be a, a so much better experience, I think, for the officers. One of the things, Raquel, that I, I hear you saying, and I heard this in Stephanie's comments too, officer work is extraordinarily complex. And the law is always changing. Policy is always evolving. And there is a need, as with any profession, whether it's the medical profession or certainly lawyers, even judicial officers, there is a need for continuing professional education and development. One of the purposes of this conversation is to kind of describe how officers might do that, you know, and and to sort of let them know that here are these three agencies to help you as an officer and organizationally probation offices pre-trial services offices to get better at your work over the course of your time in the system. The message I would like for our audience to take away from this piece of the conversation is that, you know, this is not just about addressing your immediate need as an officer. This is about helping you develop as a probation and pre-trial services professional over the arc of a career right? And continually getting better at the work that you do. I spoke with Robin Grimes, Chief U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services Officer from the Northern District of Ohio and Chair of the FJC's Probation and Pretrial Services Education Advisory Committee. Here's what she had to say about the responsibility leaders have to ensure officers are provided those continuing education opportunities. I think as chief, the one important thing you can't forget is the education of your staff and helping them learn and get the programming they need to be successful, not just in their core duties, but for a lifetime, for things that they're going to carry on outside of this career when they move on or they decide to do something differently at some point. The basic skills that you get on how to communicate, critical thinking, how to problem solve, just building relationships, fostering, you know, a climate of of teamwork and promoting diversity. Those things you can carry when you leave here, but if you don't educate people while they're here, you do a disservice. I want to continue the conversation. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, I'll talk with Stephanie and Raquel about the what and the how of officer education. In other words, what does officer education and training look like when it's happening? You're listening to Off Paper. In this age of utilizing evidence-based supervision strategies to reduce recidivism, FJC Probation and Pretrial Services Education offers districts the opportunity to participate in a program designed to help supervisors learn to improve their work with line officers. 
Supervising Officers in an Evidence-Based Environment, or SOBI for short, is an in-district, year-long blended learning program led by FJC faculty and clinical psychologist Dr. Guy Bergone. The program aims to teach supervisors an array of skills such as listening actively, providing feedback, and reinforcing officers' efforts. You will learn to apply evidence-based principles and help officers connect risk assessment results with case plans and supervision strategies. Methods for conducting focused discussion during case staffing and interactions with officers will be examined, and strategies for reviewing case plans to ensure that they reflect evidence-based supervision approaches will be explored. Recent program updates include addressing evidence-based case staffing with pre-sentence officers and sessions emphasizing leadership's role in program implementation, staff development, and district sustainability strategies. The FJC will begin accepting district applications for the 2022-2023 SOBI program in February. All districts interested in learning more and participating in this program, visit the FJC's Probation and Pretrial Services page at fjc.dcn. Let's talk about officer education and what it looks like when it's happening. And Stephanie, you've got students coming from all over the country, officers coming from all over the country. They've been hired by their district. They Some have been in their district a relatively short time. Some have been in their district quite a number of months. You've got officers coming into our system who had been probation and or pretrial services officers in their state and local systems. You've got some who've never done that work. Some were in traditional law enforcement. Some are lawyers coming in. We've got social workers, n- many social workers in the system. Could you talk about both of those aspects, sort of dealing with officers coming in from different parts of the system with different types of experience and levels of experience, but also that social piece. One great thing is November 1st, uh, new officers are coming to the academy in person. They'll have six weeks here that they can get to know people from throughout the country that will hopefully be friends for a lifetime. They have two new officer classes running at the same time so that they have those other 24 students that they can bond with the learning part of the in-person, I'm really excited to see again. They can learn from each other. For example, we do a bond report and every district does it a little differently. Um, But at least they can be here, see how it's supposed to be done, see what they need to be thinking about and learn from each other. So that bonding and that esprit de corps that can happen, especially in the IPIT program, the, the six-week initial training program for officers, it just, you can't replace that with virtual. You simply can't. So it's like a really important opportunity for them to feel a part of our system. Raquel, I'm very interested to know how your team interfaces with, with the academy. It's interesting because the 24 new officers, you may have two or three, or if you're lucky, so to speak, four or five who will actually be pre-sentence report writers. So it's kind of funny because they don't all know why they need to know this stuff. You know, we needed to be prepared to make those hours in the classroom interesting and to make them understand how it is relevant to them. I think most of the new officers understand that they need to know guidelines. They need to understand what happened before how different supervision uh, techniques or needs assessments, you know, how that is going to relate to what the case was about, what the person was like before they went to prison. We certainly hope that when officers get back to their districts, that that message is reinforced because you never actually know what your job is going to be necessarily year to year. Yeah, so this is an area that I, th- I think is is worth drilling down on a little bit because Again, we have this very unique situation where it is a national system, but the districts have their own cultures. Here's more of what Julie Capsambellis had to say about training at the district level in the Middle District of Florida. We've just taken over doing the, the strengths training ourselves. We want to focus on what's right with you. It's not that we're not going to work on and, and maybe correct any, any issues that come up as people are learning their job, but we want to focus on what's right with you. And so I wonder, Raquel, how you all navigate that as a unit that works with officers after the academy in addition to the academy. 
I think the benefit of having training by the commission is that we do see the national picture because we train in every district. And so we can bring that perspective. So part of what we do, particularly when we train a national audience, is make people aware that they, there are differences and give them something to think about. Um, in terms of our general approach to probation officers, you know, we do like to focus on best practices. Of course, best practices includes getting your guideline determination correct. There's Supreme Court law that says, regardless of the, of the, or many times, regardless of the sentence that the judge imposes, you need to start at the correct sentencing range. Otherwise, you might be sentencing that defendant one more time after that defendant successfully appeals. So there are certain best practices that go along with the guideline competency. For example, read all the application notes, right? <laughs> you know, the guideline manual is long, not necessarily because each provision is long, but because there are application notes that tell you how to do it. So there are certain things like that that we want to drill into people. We want officers to feel competent, secure, professional. We want them to be able to face situations where defense counsel or AUSAs are objecting to their guidelines determinations. First of all, from a place where they've done the work correctly. And second of all, from a place where they believe in themselves, like they believe in the quality of the work that they've done because the work can be hard. Part of the challenge that they're going to have, you know, they're not all attorneys, but they're being called on to apply case law. Some of it is super complicated. There has yet to be an appellate court that will reverse a probation officer. That's not how it works. Courts will reverse the judge's decision, right? So as the officer, you're there to support the judge and give the judge the best information you can. But ultimately, this is the judge's decision. Okay, as you said, Raquel, this is complicated stuff. What do you do to make sure officers who come to you with all levels of experiences get it? We have tried our best, you know, to provide a lot of different kinds of job aids. I mentioned before, you know, um, decision trees. We have these one page primers that sort of give you the quick and dirty, you know, from stick to stem on a, on a specific issue that we know is challenging um, to, to the officers. And, and as I said before, we wanna be available 24 seven. So there's a lot of material on our website when we do our trainings on Adobe Connect, they're recorded. So even if officers can't attend live, they can watch the recordings. We also have conducted lunch and learns, we call them, with individual districts. And so with our lunch and learns, you know, when a district will request training, we will ask very specifically, okay, you say you want a training on relevant conduct, but what are the issues? What exactly is going on in your district that we can help you with? Because we don't want to just put on a show about relevant conduct. We want to know, we want to help you solve the problems. So knowing what to do and being able to do it confidently are different things. Stephanie, how does the Academy get at that? What I heard both of you speak upon is our training isn't just there to throw out knowledge, but it's there to make the officer have good judgment and good decision making and make them feel confident once they get back in district or at any time during their career. That's what we as instructors here try to do. So we have to try to, during every block of instruction, reiterate the good and the things that they can improve upon because we do that's we want them to leave the academy feeling confident in their skills and a lot of times they are even if they're not getting just say the use of force in their decision making upon day one maybe it's an entirely new thing for them maybe they came from the social work arena you know and now they're going to possibly be carrying a firearm by the end of the six weeks program I can tell you that they feel more confident because we put them through all sorts of training. We put them in labs that they can practice their skills after the lecture or presentation is done. We put them through practical exercises and we continually try to work on those skills to develop them and give them time to 
practice them so that and articulate why they used a certain level of force perhaps uh, in tactical pistol you know because it just doesn't come to some of us you know we have to learn we have to go through scenarios and uh, build our confidence because it may be new and even if it's not new they may have come from local law enforcement their use of force policy is completely different than ours and so being able to retrain their brain and know what they can do is hard for some of them but they take during their six weeks here, not only eight hours of training, but they do, they talk about things and build that rapport with their instructors and their colleagues during, you know, lunches, um, after hours. We're always available after hours if they have additional questions or are struggling. We stay late and we do skill enhancements or we stay late and talk to them about a discipline that they're struggling with. We have those people here at the academy that can go one-on-one, -on -one, say, what's going on? What can we do to help? And how can we get you to where you need to be? Raquel, what guidance or advice might you have for folks, like whether it's a training specialist or a training committee, program development coordinator, they have different titles and they operate different ways at the district level. What comes to mind when you think about that? Sure. So I will say a couple of things. Number one, rely on commission resources. We have them. If you are a training coordinator, call us. You can reach us through the helpline or you can reach us online. We have a, a special training app that you can access online and put in a request or ask a question or whatever. Um, we have had um, training coordinators reach out to us and we will give them, for example, the teacher's edition to all of our, to all of our national seminar sessions. We'll even go over it with you if you want. And then you can be the trainer, you know, of those officers who weren't able to attend, or you're just doing it, you know, for reinforcement. Um, sometimes when people call and request training, we'll s suggest go online, have your officers do our e-learning courses. We cover an awful lot of fundamentals on those courses. Assign them. You know, the courses have quizzes. Um, assign the courses. And then, you know, set up a meeting with us where officers can ask questions. You know, we can do, as I mentioned, the, our lunch and learns over teams, but reach out to us. Recognize the need for ongoing training. We can customize curricula. You don't have to come up with the training program all by your lonesome. <laughs> Stephanie, uh, same question for you in terms of guidance to in-district trainers, training committees, etc. about to the degree they can in improve continuity in terms of what goes on at the academy and what goes on in the district. We have our website that has been newly created or revised that's definitely more helpful. We have all of our curriculum in packs for officers and instructors to be able to access and review. But just like Raquel said, if you if the district has a need, give us a call, send us an email. And if we are the best person to provide that training or give you resources, fantastic. But if we believe that FJC or US Sentencing Commission has better information or can train better in those areas, We'll hand them off and you guys will take good care of them. Please don't hesitate to reach out anytime. Yeah, I mean, that's that's also, I would reiterate that from the FJC perspective. If you are a district training specialist, if you are on a training committee and you want to try to up the game on your in-district training, reach out to me or any of my counterparts who are involved with officer training it would be Lori Murphy, our executive education director, or Joy Richardson, who manages our management and professional development education group. All of us work with probation and pretrial, and we are instructional designers. We are content developers. We work with 
individual districts all the time to help them improve their approach to in-district training, but wanted to just reinforce the fact that that's yet another function that our agencies serve is supporting the in-district training of officers for purposes of improving continuity, improving quality, and and really just having a, an ex- officers having an excellent educational experience as professionals trying to to do their job. So I appreciate both of you providing some input on that. So this is off paper. I'm talking with Stephanie Denton of the Federal Probation and Pretrial Academy and Raquel Wilson of the U.S. Sentencing Commission's Education and Sentencing Practice Unit. When we come back, we'll wrap things up by discussing some front burner officer education issues that our three teams are confronting and how each of us is thinking about the future of officer education. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Lori Murphy, a colleague of Mark Sherman and head of the Executive Education Group at the FJC. We have a podcast that focuses on leadership in the federal courts called In Session, Leading the Judiciary, that I think you'll like. Each episode features current research and cutting edge insights into leadership. Guests include Michael Lewis, groundbreaking author of The Undoing Project and Moneyball, Professor Jennifer Eberhardt, implicit bias researcher at Stanford University, and Harvard Business School's expert on psychological safety, Amy Edmondson. Each episode strives to enhance listeners' critical thinking skills, encourage expression of authentic leadership, and promote the use of best practices among judiciary executives. Episodes are available wherever you get your podcasts or on fjc.dcn. Join us. The podcast is In Session, Leading the Judiciary. Stephanie and Raquel, it's been a tumultuous time for educating officers since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, but I feel like we've all learned a lot from the situation. Certainly, as educators, we've had to embrace distance learning like never before, but also the pandemic has influenced how officers do their work. So I want to talk with you both about those things. Let's start with some of the front burner issues of substantive officer education. And Raquel, starting with you, what are some of the new areas where officers are needing assistance? The First Step Act was one really significant statutory change that happened in sentencing. And I know officers were dealing with, you know, defendants returning to court for recalculation of their guidelines in drug cases because of retroactive penalty changes and so forth. There's uh, the safety valve in drug offenses. Somewhat recently, there has emerged a circuit split over a safety valve issue. Um, The 11th Circuit has ruled one way, the 9th Circuit has ruled another way. And if the 9th Circuit ruling were to become the law of the land, not a lot of people would be ineligible for safety valve. So um, the, the way the 9th Circuit interprets the First Step Act's statutory change makes an awful lot of drug offenders eligible for safety valve. It, it would actually be quite a large expansion. And so we've been getting calls about that, you know, well, what do we do? And again, that's an area where you have to be competent in uh, the guidelines, the case law, how it operates. And you also have to adopt some best practices with the litigants and with the judge, because ultimately the decision of which side of that circuit split will your judge fall fall on, that's gonna be up to the litigants to argue and for the judge to decide. So it's sort of a perfect illustration of where it all comes together. Um, Something that is probably an evergreen issue for us until a major change in policy is crimes of violence, right? The so-called categorical approach uh, given to us by the Supreme Court more than 20 years ago. So um, that is something that is constantly changing. You know, oftentimes uh, defense attorneys are challenging, you know, prior convictions on the grounds that they're not crimes of violence. And it's always, you know, you're sort of entering the morass. I mean, it's a, it's a thorny, difficult area 
Um, you really can never do enough training on that one. Um, we have a series of podcasts that attempts to explain the categorical approach um, in plain terms. Um, we answer the questions on the helpline. We, we've done uh, training on that topic on Adobe Connect. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, hit it um, from all sides. We really stress the fundamentals in working through specific areas, relevant conduct, criminal history, grouping of multiple counts. Those are areas where we have a multitude of resources and essentially we will never stop training those. You know, we have new officers that need to learn it and sometimes it's the case and we have heard this directly from veteran officers. I've been doing that wrong for 20 years. <laughs> so we want to make sure that for the next 20 years of your career, you're doing it right. So to the listening audience, I just want to say, Never fear, we've got good education and training and it's it's all good and we have a system where there's lots of error correction and I feel like that's an extraordinary place to begin this conversation. Stephanie, I'm really curious about emerging areas that you're attempting to build into and address into the uh, new officer curriculum. Um, you know, we we know that over the past several years, but certainly over the past couple of years, one of the issues being the pandemic, but not the only issue, the issue of officer wellness has really become front and center, and you all are, are working on that. So talk about that, certainly, but anything else also that would be important for us to be aware of in terms of emerging areas and new areas of substantive officer training? I think the two biggest areas that... Um we've started to enhance our, our officer wellness because we believe that the, at the academy that we can hopefully lay the foundation uh, for the new officer and continue to promote and talk about wellness and how they can continue to take care of themselves throughout their entire career. So that is one focus of the academy that's definitely in uh, the six-week class that is coming in, we've enhanced it to four hours um, during that uh, six-week class. And the other biggest area, probably, I would say, is our diversity, equity, and inclusion training will be revised, hopefully, by 2023. We will enhance it to at least four hours. I don't know if we can enhance it beyond that right now, but maybe. So those are a couple areas. Now, as you guys know, I mean these two things fit together, I believe. And one of the great things, I mean, we have the National Wellness um, Committee, which is transitioning to a working group, which I'm really excited for. We have Melinda Felix, who's serving as a 50% TDY in that area for the wellness um, working group or at wellness overall for our system. So she's it's going to be so helpful because I don't have the time to make things happen sometimes. She is going to be able to fly with the initiatives and continue to move forward in our system because we need it. We need a person completely focused on the wellness of our staff because they're not all well. Um, they're, it's not. They're not. And from officers to support staff, um, to trainers, whoever it may be, and I just think it's so important with our lives right now and how stressful our jobs, their jobs, new officer jobs, chief's jobs can be. So I'm thinking that new working group uh, will be fantastic. Um, we've also created, and this is not for new officers, but it's for chiefs. We've created an ad hoc working group for dealing chiefs to deal with critical incidents. Um, we're looking to um, to revise the chief's guide to managing a use of force incident, the casualty assistance guide, um, and many other areas because there are a lot of new chiefs and there's a lot of chiefs that are experiencing some critical incidents in their districts that we can learn from and we can continue to build on it and figure out and make our own plan on how to deal with the situation because I need to know too. And so I've learned a ton through this because things happen every day, whether it's staff suicide to, you know, our officers and staff having cancer 
or medical issues or children dying, whatever the case may be. So I just think it really comes together in trying to have people have healthier lives. We're sort of seeing very similar things, uh, obviously, in terms of emerging areas for officer training. So one of the areas that, that we have been working a lot on over the past few years, and it continues to become more intense and interesting, is systems thinking. Really inculcating within officers how to think systemically, even if you are a pre-trial focused officer or a pre-sentence officer or a post-conviction officer. Very important for you to, to be aware of what officers who do those other functions do, as well as the other stakeholders in the system and how the system operates generally and your place in it and that it's all connected. So decisions made at the pre-trial stage affect decisions made at the pre-sentence stage, affect sentencing, affect what happens down the if the person is sentenced to a term of incarceration in the BOP, because that ends up in the pre-sentence report, which goes downstream, and then obviously post-conviction supervision. And so we one of the areas that we have really been working a lot on over the past few years, and again, it increases with intensity as we move forward, is bringing together officers with other actors in the system for purposes of education. So we do that, for example, with officers and magistrate judges or officers with magistrate judges and district judges. Occasionally, we'll do it with defense attorneys and or prosecutors. So we can sort of do cross training or at least joint training. And we we address all three areas. So, you know, with pretrial, obviously, what does it mean to draft a bail report and work with a magistrate judge who is the consumer of that bail report, right, and has to make a detention or and a release decision. Another area is, as you mentioned, Stephanie, this area of wellness that we call resilience and workload management, because those are the two of the 10 competencies that really embrace this issue of wellness. We're doing more work there. In terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's so much going on in our system right now. There is what you referred to, Stephanie, happening at the national level, which is key. Uh, but then individual districts are also working on it. And in terms of our team's work, we bring no unique expertise to that area, but we are very good at working with districts and helping them figure out how to work on any number of education and training areas, including but not limited to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're working with a few districts that have DEI committees that are attempting to provide education and training on an ongoing basis in their districts. So we're working with them to help them figure out what that looks like how that will roll out, what that kind of instruction or programming looks like. We do a lot of work with problem-solving courts. There are now about 130 federal problem-solving courts, everything from pretrial through post-conviction reentry courts, drug courts, veterans treatment courts, mental health courts. There's a gang court in the federal system now, and our team does a lot of work there. And the, the demand there is growing. So we, we, we've noticed that as well. And then it sort of uh, this other area that's emerging in the federal system, really just beginning to emerge, it's something that's been happening at the state and local level now for a number of years, is restorative justice. So, and, and that kind of goes along well with problem-solving courts, but it's something that we have found there is increasing demand to learn more about. There are a couple of districts now in the federal system that have restorative justice programs. And so really sort of where our agency kind of works best is in the interstices of these different policy areas or perhaps areas where there is no policy yet, but where there's practice happening and we can bring officers together or different stakeholders together and, and, and help them work through what are the best practices until there is a policy. In, in, inevitably, there will be in all of these areas, but it takes time, sometimes years for national policy to really like coagulate, like to happen. And so, but the practice is happening in the meantime and, and the practitioners want some guidance. I want to switch gears and, and finish up with a conversation about what we've learned as educators, especially over the past 20 months, 
this has had to influence, meaning this, the, the pandemic and how we've adjusted to it with virtual education. It's had to influence your thinking and your team's thinking about education going forward once we're past the pandemic and into a new normal. What, what does the future look like for officer training, Raquel? Well, I can say that uh, these past nearly two years um, have taught us that, you know, virtual training is not a replacement for in-person training, but it is an essential component of training. It allows us to be more available, more nimble, more creative. You know, people can access us without leaving their offices, without scheduling, you know, our travel and an all day seminar and so forth and and, and all of the logistics that that entails. You know, for us, I had laid out a vision, my unit had laid out a vision back in late 2019 when we had our planning retreat for 2020. And my shorthand was that 2020 would be the year of building relationships. (laughs) I had no idea, right, that we would be building these relationships online. At the time, I had no idea that it was even possible to build relationships online. But frankly, I think we've had a lot of successes and I think we have built relationships. I think, you know, relationships are really at the at the core of education and frankly the mentorship that takes place, you know, over the course of a uh, of an officer's career. So, you know, we have done it um, online. We're going to continue doing it. You know, I love, obviously, I love our Adobe Connect, you know, our national sessions because people get to experience sentencing through the eyes of people, you know, from other districts where they normally wouldn't get to do that except for one time at our national seminar. I absolutely love our lunch and learns, you know, when the district contacts us and we get them to do perhaps a little more work than they've had to do in the past in terms of really figuring out, okay, what are our issues? You know, we're asking for training on this. Why are we asking for training on this? What is happening? What are our officers experiencing? How is our case load changing? What is causing us to ask for this training? And how can we home in on specifically what the issues are so that we can have a really in-depth, conversation, you know, in a safe learning space. I love that program and I want more districts to take advantage of that. And it does that doesn't have to be a single district by the way. I mean, you can get together with, you know, another district if you want to do it that way. I love our online helpline. You know, we've operated a, a telephone-based helpline for forever, but now you can submit questions online. And we're and we will call you back, of course. You know, we don't have an online conversation, we'll call you back. But what we're finding is after people attend our lunch and learn, or after people attend our Adobe Connect session or watch a video or whatever, you know, they may be doing that in a group, right? And then someone will call us on the helpline. You know, they've conducted a training and inevitably, you know, they'll get a, a call say, hey, I attended your training. I had this follow-up question. Can you help me? The answer is, of course, right? You know, I want to have office hours. I want to make it to where, you know, 2022, we do an online session. And then, you know, later that afternoon or the next day, the subject matter experts who conducted that training are available, right, for a set time to answer some follow-up questions. I want to see people getting on our website, downloading materials, looking for materials. I love it when, you know, we'll do a session, say, on grouping of multiple counts. And then two weeks later, the helpline call will be, I downloaded your decision tree. I already did my determination. I think it's this. I just want to check and see, did I do it correctly? I love that because that means that our materials have empowered that officer to find the answer themselves. Um, And I love then that they're calling us, you know, sort of not, you know, what's the answer, but they're calling us because they've reached an answer and they just want that reinforcement. And I want to I want to model that right 
one officer is doing it. I want them to tell their colleague, hey, this is how I did it. I want them to tell their supervisor, this is how we're doing it now. I'm really pleased in a sense <laughs> with the way 2020 and 2021 have gone in the sense of building relationships. And I really just think the key is to not only sustain those relationships in the coming years, but really just deepen them wherever we can. Thank you so much. And Stephanie, sort of, where would you like to see the future go in terms of delivering education based on what you and your team have learned over the past 20 months? I do think that it changed our thinking about what could be done. We love to teach in person, and I do believe that a lot of what we do cannot be replaced. For example, firearms and safety needs to be hands-on in person, and districts do not have time with their caseloads to do it. I mean, they are doing it, don't get me wrong, but they they shouldn't need they shouldn't have to do that. They need to take care of things that are going on in district right now. So I think for the firearms and safety portion, you know, obviously it will always need to be in person. Now, you know, in 2023 or 2024, potentially the IPIT program could look different. Uh, we've had some discussions about what could be continue to be delivered online or virtually in the virtual world and what cannot. So it may look different in the future. I mean, we have put on so many, not only the virtual IPIT program, but also other firearms and safety classes that can be, we can reach, like Raquel was talking about, reach a greater number of officers or instructors or chiefs, training for chiefs we've had at the academy. So I would say that the IPIT program could look a little different um, and could include many different things that chiefs are wanting to see. You know, one of the th other classes that was um, added to the FY22 schedule was a writing class because a lot of chiefs uh, um, said that that was an area of concern. Now, we don't have a ton of time allocated to that, but at least if we can touch on it, lay a foundation and make them understand that that is something that's important to their districts, maybe we can do that. So, and I think that some of our other trainings that we deliver, we have a firearms instructor training program, an initial firearms instructor training program, and we are delivering a couple exported trainings. Well, that training is going to look different as well. We're going to do some online virtual training before actually going out to an area of the country to deliver the hands-on portion. So that's already looking a little different. And I think that many of our classes could be affected by that in the future. Thank you. So, you know, and again, just sort of to sum up from the FJC side, I, you know, we're seeing very similar trends. We, we have learned so much from educating people virtually 24-7, basically, without doing in-person. So it's not going to go away. There are ways that the virtual approach will really supplement our in-person programming. We'll be able to do some hybrid programming. And we're thinking about it uh, in ways that, that we just weren't thinking about before because we weren't forced to. Instead of having one platform really for distance education, we now have three platforms. And, and we've got people who've developed some really serious expertise in using those platforms over the past 20 months because they've had to. And because there has not been a demand reduction for, for education and just the opposite. So we've got all these new tools that we can use and it's not like the virtual education is going to go away. It will be part of the, what is the new normal in a really positive and dynamic way where we are going to be able to reach, as you all have both said, so many more people than we have been able to reach with just the, the in-person and even the recorded in-person programs that we make available as resources from our website. So I really appreciate you both describing that. And it's potentially very exciting to think about what the future of, of education for probation and pretrial services officers looks like. So, and with that, Raquel and Stephanie, I, I just want to thank you both so much for talking with us. 
Thank you for having me. This was super fun and really informative. And Stephanie, we will have coffee. (laughs) That sounds great. Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting us as well. I'm super excited. And Raquel, you are coming down to the Academy soon. (laughs) I'm just thrilled that we've had this conversation and very much look forward to continuing to work with you and your teams and uh, excited about the future. So thanks so much. Off Paper is produced by Shelley Easter. The program is directed by Craig Bowden. Our program coordinator is Anna Glochkova. Don't forget, folks, you can subscribe to Off Paper on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Mark Sherman. Thanks for listening. See you next time. This podcast was produced at U.S. taxpayer expense.